Ladies and gents, uh, welcome back. We've got the uh, fabulous Mika Borsrum, who's uh, joining us from Smarkets. And we're going to learn a little bit about um, Smarkets today, but not so much. Mika is going to help us focus on what makes good engineering workflow, how to create a low friction development cycle, and a couple of other secret ingredients that he's got. Um, to creating well-oiled teams. So, Mika, do you want to just give us a, a real quick introduction, say hello to the guys and girls that are listening, and tell us a little bit about your background. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my shed. So, <laughs> I've, I'm here at Smiles. I've been at Smiles now for almost seven years. Before that, I did logistics and security appliances in Finland. And, and after that one, I did embedded engineering for high-end high -end Linux systems. So I come from, from varying backgrounds, and I've done almost a mixed, mixed bag of everything you can imagine. And sort of background, as in what is markets? Okay, so we run what is called a betting exchange or a prediction market. But let's be honest, we enable gambling. That is, that is the long and short of it. So... In, as in the PR, the interest, or everything that is actually valuable and is interesting for society is on prediction markets and political events as things happen and how which of the crowds essentially distills it down of, of something likely to happen or unlikely to happen. The money is in sports betting and gambling, so we do both. That's the that's the honest truth, and that's also why we nice. operate okay. under a fairly regulated environment because gambling as an industry, has a deservedly horrible reputation. We have operators who, who prey on their customers and have effectively distilled and, and, and fine-tuned predatory practices over decades. As in, Facebook had nothing on gambling industry before they came on, online. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. That's a cracking intro. Okay. Um, talk to us a little bit about the um, engineering makeup of uh, the company and your teams at the moment. So, Smarkets used to be engineering heavy, over half of engineers. These days, it's, I think, 35 to 40% of engineering headcount over, from 120-ish total and split over half a dozen-ish different teams depending on how you count. And the idea is that teams are, are supposed to be as independent as possible. And they are responsible always for their own services, and they are responsible to their customers, whether they are internal or external. And that's something I'm going to get back on later on. But the idea is that the teams effectively, they are mostly in control of their own roadmap, how they want to do, what they want to do in what time frames, And also they are responsible for for Agreeing that to others, that who, those who depend on their output or who can use their, their products are available to know what can be done at what time frames and what they can expect. And all of that sort of a, feeds into how engineering itself works. So we still, even if we have, we rely on industry where marketing is everything, optics matter. Engineering itself is driven effectively by slightly on gut instinct and good, and good ideas, but mostly on numbers. As in, if you have numbers and you show something works, people generally will go, fine, let's give it a go. Okay. Um, let's, di let's dive into um, some of the subject title that you and I quite like. Okay. Low friction development cycle. What does that phrase actually mean? What does that mean to you and the team? Uh, I think it means only really two things. One is that how hard is it to get your idea into, into practice and see it, see it do something for real? That's number one. Number two, how, much, how long a road do you have to go from getting the idea into production, actually seeing it produce some results? So how, how fast can you get an idea from conception through your keyboard, through CI, through builds into pr production? And then also, how, how fast can you see how it actually worked? So how well can you get readings out of that, that one? Did it actually work? Was it a good idea? So, and the idea being that, that you don't need particular approval to try something out unless you think that it might, you might actually have some, someone to have a second look. Other than that, it's basically give it a go, get numbers, reevaluate. If it was a bad idea, take it out. If it was a good idea, 
Step on it. Okay. <laughs> what What's your average time at the moment? Do you have those figures? What's your average time from idea to production? Uh, I think we've actually gone down a bit, as in we've matured slightly. So it used to be something that you could have an idea uh, at 10 in the morning and have it in production by 2 p.m. These days, I think we've slowed it down a bit. So if you have an idea which you'd like to try out, usually you end up giving a sort of a quick discussion with your team, as in, I don't, as in something goes out, it goes to code review, as in you push, push the branch, you have it, have it a go, if it actually makes sense. And on a good day, it may end up going out on the same day. So you might commit code in a branch, uh, say, after 11 in the morning, and it might be shipped before 5 p.m. Wow. What, what are some of the examples? Can you give us any of examples that idea at 11, out the door by somewhere between 3 and 5 p.m.? Uh, usually something that strictly depends on the front end or something which is merely expose a new new feature or new field on the API. So something which, if, if you provide a new field on the API, which funding can make use of, it's something that you can sh- usually have an idea, provide a, get an update out on the same day, and front end might be able to give it a sort of a go in staging on the same day. You, if it's something which is actually more customer-centric and has wider implications, usually it takes two or three days from an idea to get to, okay, can we actually put it out? Because usually... Also, you need to have your clients actually conceive the change. And what you have had in mind, if it wasn't planned, you need to sort of slide it in into the other ad hoc work, as in, does it make sense? And teams always have more work to do than they have time for and or capacity for. And I don't know any company who would have sort of a comp- all the time just excess capacity available. So it's one of the things. Is it, if it's a small thing, then be tried out. If it's a large thing, if it's actually something which is a brand new feature, you actually need to slide it down and schedule it in, in the in planning of either the next larger sprint or after that one. So it depends on the size of it. But good ideas usually go out if, if they are easy to do in day or two. I, I can imagine naturally that's, um, that's an evolution with time, with maturation. How long has it taken you to get to that point? with your teams, how long were you working on that for? I think it has always been like this. So I came here in late 2013 and it was already there at that point. The culture has always been easily ship it out, get data, reevaluate. And yes, we lived by the startup mantra that ship it off and break and break it if necessary, but breaking things that are user visible are not okay. Especially in real-time gambling, where any any disruption is horrible. Effectively, customers are eager to complain, and it's okay, it is expected. But more than that, because we are do real-time gambling, and we require updates on customer funds to, to match reality, we, effectively, within the Nielsen threshold, as in the lowest one. When a customer does something, and they click a button, has to come back like that, 100 milliseconds, is effectively yeah. the ceiling, how far something must have happened to see that actually, at least it was re- registered, even if it isn't a- happened yet. And that's something which shows that it's, it's possible to break things which are ancillary, but anything which is on a critical path should never break. And that's basically where it comes down from. So we do more testing, we do more robust testing, and we have better rolling out cycles, how the changes actually get rolled out. So instead of just shipping it out and breaking it, these days we use stage, canary deploys, gradual rollout, things happen. And the thing which I think we as a company can be proud of is that we have production that rejects bad deployments. So even if you have a deployment, even if it, if the build itself worked, went through all tests, went through nicely, and when it starts to roll out, if it actually starts to fail, and we have met, we have done to collecting and calling those failures correctly, production will reject and roll it back automatically which is a feature which is genuinely, it gives the, the engineering sa- sort of safe, safety net and safety and security of mind that you know you can try things out and as long as the, the plumbing is there and is, sol- is solid, you can try things out and you know if, if it happened to affect someone, at least it only affects a small minority for a, for a few seconds and that's okay. Uh, we we want to get to testing later, you know, offline, 
you and I have spoken about that. And we're going to talk about some really good engineering principles. And I know how important testing is for you guys. Um, where do companies go wrong, do you think, not keeping this startup mantra and, if you like, fail fast mantra or break things mantra? Where do companies go wrong? What, why does it become so saturated, do you think? Uh, I think it goes both ways. So it can either degrade to free for all, where nobody cares about quality or nobody cares about the experience that happens to users, or it can degrade to the other side where everything has to go through a series of bottlenecks and sign-offs and gatekeepers. And as in companies who veer on the break everything side are effectively still finding out what they can do, and companies who be on the other side are those who are usually hobbled down by increasing regulation and other external pressure where they are no longer allowed to do things as, as fast as they can. And the pressure on keeping the fluidity, on balancing the, where, the, where the compliance and regulation needs press down on the velocity, I, I do a lot of work on keeping that friction to the minimum. And part of that is that we always value tiny increments. So we ship really tiny increments, so we know that the delta in production is small, so the testing, testing delta as well should be fairly small most of the time. It's easy enough to roll back, so we know that even if it broke and it wasn't rolled back automatically, we can always go back to the previous version. So it's safe. The, one of the main, main ideas or main concepts of the Agile Manifesto was that if something is painful, you should do it more often, to the point where it is no longer painful. And we do with that one. And we also support auto-deploy for our projects. So it is optional for, for teams to choose on project per project basis. They can choose that any time a new artifact is released, it is auto-deployed. Again, using the same canary mechanics where production rejects a bad deployment. That's something which brings in immense benefits because everyone has effectively men mental safety net that they know, okay, I can try this out and it's still okay. Nice. And okay. I've run some numbers over the over the summer from June and July. Uh, I actually run this one. So average deployment size is three code commits only. Okay. So and the media and merge request is one commit. Okay. So so or, or, so on average, the whatever goes out has only divided by at most three commits. And almost universally, the cha individual changes that are, that are being rolled out into master are just one commit each. Nice. So the logical granularity is there. And that allows to make it so easy to keep track of what's, what's happening. And also, what, if, it, if it broke, take it out. Because it means that all production, all code has to satisfy the content that, that any, any of the two versions can run at any time in the production. So they, it's important to keep the compatibility backwards and forwards always in mind. Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, we're we're going to get to some of those engineering principles, and I don't necessarily want you to um, re-explain yourself, but I think even if we broke it down for teams, because I think there'll be people listening in the audience who will think, ah, that's something that we can introduce to the team. Uh, you've got some cracking ideas that people will take value from. So we'll simplify it and break it down a little bit further. What, what I like about um, you is you've been able to create the fl or continue the fluidity in such a highly regulated environment, whereas you spoke about that being um, one of the things that you think may hold companies back. So... You may have covered it, but how, how do you think you're able to do that? Do you think from more of a business perspective, not necessarily technology perspective? Because there will be gatekeepers. You obviously have to reduce some of the dependencies being the people. But how do you do it more from a business perspective, not necessarily from a deployment and testing perspective? I think the big one there is that, that uh, we roll, because we roll our changes continuously, effectively we've we'll, we'll also conditioned our customers to the fact that, that some features may evolve bit by bit. And also part of that is that, that our customers are extremely vocal. 
So when something looks looks bad or doesn't look right, they will complain over Twitter, over forums, yeah. over customer support, and anything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Anything that ends up being obviously a complaint magnet is something that okay, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Usually, something which is big enough, like where we actually want to drive a change to somewhere, it gets rolled out usually after. But proper planning, proper design changes, and then it gets rolled out. We know that when a change comes in, the default assumption is that change is for bad. Change is bad. When something changes for an end user point of view, they don't like it. So there's always going to be some pushback against anything that comes up differently. But if the complaints either increase or they persist, it obviously means okay, that wasn't a good idea after all. The question then is, what? Where does the comp where does the problem stem from? Uh, do we have numbers to, sh to show how it would work? Can we either roll it back entirely, or can we in incrementally improve it to the state where it actually is functionally what we want, but still satisfies the customer expectations? So that's why having larger UI experience changes are so drastic, because we know that they introduce something which wasn't previously there, or it breaks expecting expected sort of a workflows for customers. And from those, they end up being a bigger bang. And then it's important to know that, okay, how long can we sort of keep them out there to collect feedback? And if the feedback doesn't improve, okay, can we undo it after all? And then part of those do end up going out eventually after a few iterations because there are certain features we wanted out, but they weren't right on the first couple of times. And part of that one really is that because we are in an industry where effectively customers have zero or next to zero brand loyalty. It does mean that effectively abusing customers or, or, or falling onto bad workflows or bad experiences is something which it, it burns. The 311 rule amplifies itself online massively. Customers who have good experience on average tell to three other people. Those who have 11 tell to 11 others. Add Twitter to the mix and you're now talking number squared. Yeah. Okay. So actually, li so listening to the customers, creating, well, Twitter created that for you, <laughs> like a, a feedback environment where you can literally real time read what people see or say about what you're doing. Good. And yes, using pretty... that, um, I, th I think probably the business probably have to be on board as well, right? And, and look at it. And like you've said, if you get burnt, you may not see that customer for a month, 12 months, a year, ever again, right? So, exactly. okay, smart. Uh, offline, you've also said some really interesting points around your architecture reflects the communication in the company. Yes, as in, I'm not the only one to say this. Actually, it is, it is known as Conway's Law, which goes the other way around, which said, it states that uh, architecture of a, of a system reflects the communication structure of the teams or the organization building it. Only from the other side, it means that, that architecture that exists ends up also, ref is, it tells me how teams communicate. So, so components that depend on each other and talk more to each other, each other or does it mean that the teams who are responsible for those will also talk more a bit among them? And I, I consider that a good thing. So, I, so Conway's law tends to be specified as either a neutral thing or a bad thing. I look at this with a silver lining. Conway's law tells me that, okay, if I have an architecture where there are couplings, there are log logical couplings between components, I know for a fact that those teams, in order to be efficient, will be talking more. And there's going to be more discussion going on back and forth when something happens or something needs to be happened between those teams. So it's easy to identify Effectively, the tentacles of any given change. If you want to introduce something new, figure out which other components end up being affected, and you immediately know which teams will will, will need to be on, on board as early as possible. That, that's that's a good point. We've spoken on the podcast before about uh, inclusivity, pairing, creating playbooks. How do you get your teams talking? It, it, it's it's a tough thing. It seems in the industry getting engineering and product talking sometimes is tough how do you like to do it uh i actually mentioned this already but i mentioned that teams are responsible first and foremost to the 
to their own customers. Meaning that someone who consumes a team's product will automatically give feedback when something happens or when, when they need something. Or an upstream of where who team depends on automatically means that when they have problems or they want to provide something new, they will automatically siphon that out to that, those teams. So the teams themselves, as long as they are in charge of their own roadmaps, in charge of their own features, and know that they are also responsible for figuring out how to get them in, into reality, actually, it means that they end up automatically more or less talking to each other. Sure, you do need someone out there to sort of keep track of, okay, is this happening? Is, are people siloing out? Especially right now, we've, we, used to, we were so used to being in the office, being able to walk over to yeah. another room it helped. Right now, it's more of a, okay, there's something going on. Can we just get the t same, same guys chatting either over Slack, over email, over GitLab issues, or on a video conference call? And as long as it happens organically, great. If it doesn't, then sort of give it a nudge. Okay, do we need a meeting of this? And everyone knows that if you need to schedule a meeting, it's going to be a wasted time for half of the people in there. Fine. So people would rather prefer not to have that meeting and figure it out sort of asynchronously, if, if at all possible. Which is actually quite nice. Uh, and w was it was it difficult to create that culture at the start? At, at the start uh, of building teams, making them more customer focused. Was it tough building that talking at the start, or not really? It, uh, not really. No. Again, it stems to the fact that we've always been customer focused. So we've always been the idea that that whatever goes out, it if it affects someone someone in a visible way then you're responsible for fixing it as well. And it, it worked fine as a small group until we got to some, somewhere around 20 engineers. That's a, a spot where we had to split into teams. And from that point onwards, it, it's become more or less that, okay, here are the domains where teams are responsible. And then they automatically want to build something. And for a very long time, we depended on teams independently and autonomously, just discussing among themselves, what do they want, what do they need? It was driven effectively by marketing but in a really sort of a sort of a business sort of a, I would say church-like way, marketing had four major milestones in a in a year. They knew what they wanted to provide for customers or for yeah. a particular feature launch to match to be available or match some particular event, and then those would be pushed forward, downward to see that okay, we want to provide this kind of feature. What do we need for this? And it still worked up a, up to somewhere twenty five or thirty people. After that one, it ended up being, okay, we need to sort of think a bit more ahead. And I am honest, we are still kind of finding ways to keep the sort of a longer term roadmaps in mind. What, what we want to do and in what time frames. Part of it being that we end up still being in an environment where we need to maybe adjust our plans really rapidly. For instance, yeah. we've had to change the order in which we rolled out into new jurisdictions. We were planning to do a particular U.S. state first, they they ended up being as really tightly regulated and actually quite hard environment to go through. But the work done to to get towards that goal allowed us to actually go to another state which had almost same building blocks in place, but had had less red tape overall yeah. to work to worry about. The reporting is still immense, but it allowed to do things faster, and it allowed to also launch in Sweden in the meanwhile because most of the work. Nice satisfy the same things again. And part of that really is that, that just knowing the teams for the teams and what they want to do in the future helps and knowing what they expected of them helps. And I try to keep up. I only thing I care about really is that the workflow itself works. Yeah. That it, is, it should be possible to try things out. It should be possible to rely on production being okay. It has to be, has to be okay to ship things and not have it break things for others. As yeah. long as that culture is in place, I'm fine. I don't have to worry about anything else. Only thing I worry about is anything that, that adds friction. I, 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 my, I ask myself the question, how can I reduce that friction? Okay. How can I get myself out of the way? Nice. Good. Okay. Can we go back to some of those points in regards to workflow? You know, the, the culture, it seems like... Uh, it's it's really set in stone. It, it's been that way for such a long time. Um, the workflow, again, it seems like it's been in place for a long time. What what we have to try and remember is some of the people listening won't have worked in um, such a slick workflow and culture environment. So 
are you able to just break that down for us in terms of testing, in terms of rolling back, deployments? How can people start to introduce this into some of what they're doing or talk to their teammates about some of this stuff? I think the easy way out is to start from the fact that that I know you mentioned in, in sort of a notes that you want to talk about Green Master or Evergreen Master later right. on. And it, I'm going to sort of pull it already. The idea is that all development always happens in branches. Okay. And when I mentioned that we do frequent merges, we do really tiny changes. So branches are short-lived. All testing happens against branches at all times. And and also the killer is that that in, in our, our company, no human pushes to master. We have a bot that does, does it for us. After you, you push to you push to a branch, you develop your features there, the branch is tested against always moving master itself. Once the test pass, once it's been reviewed, once it's been okayed by other teams that it's, it's okay, we set the bot to say that, okay, this is now okay. The bot does final tests against current master. If it still works, it does a merge, builds artifacts from there. Means that because it was tested in a branch, we know it also it will test and build correctly in the master as well. Meaning that it is always possible. Anyone can ship any service at any given time, and that should be expected. So we have a workflow about to do that for us, but any company who wants to start with that should just basically forbid pushing to master and have everything happen by a server-side logic or or something where you review code in a, in a branch, you test it in a branch, and then you have it merged and you build artifacts from master. Nice. At that point, you always have incentive to make sure that the it, whatever comes in, in branches is solid enough, it works against master. When you build it from master, it's already deployable. Those two steps effectively mean that that Whenever you, sh you ship something, whenever you put a change in place, it doesn't break anyone else's workflow. It doesn't prevent anyone else from shipping. It doesn't prevent anyone, sh prevent anyone shelf shelf from doing further changes. So that sort of a small small changes, team autonomy, and evergreen master, and tiny increments, they all feed into one. But I don't expect any company to just go to do server side side merges or or use a bot to do the work our kind. But at least start from the fact that you you start you introduce the concept of evergreen master, which no human ever pushes to. That's a good start. It once you have that in place, it's possible to increase the amount of testing you do in branch. It's possible to increase the amount of scrutiny, the lifetime what you do. It's possible to increase the visibility of your changes bit by bit. And from there, once you have feature branches that are short-lived continuously. It also opens a possibility of, of testing multiple parallel staging environments, which we want to build towards, but it's something which I know several companies who have it absolutely swear by. Because when you can spin up transient testing environments and then run those, you're golden. We're not there yet, but I want to get there as well. Nice. I love that. Uh, and what, a, what about um, deployments and looking at the ops side of things? Talk to us a little bit again about um, integrating uh, some of that workflow into culture as well. Well, again, the idea is that although anyone can ship any service they like, what they actually are expected to do, that they, can, they are supposed to ship only services they are actually in charge of. And we are... We are increasingly enforcing that one. So you can set auto deploy, at which point you're responsible that when your code lands in, it has to be robust. Otherwise, you trigger the deployment yourself, or someone some in your team does, and then they keep, keep an eye on it. If it was a good deployment, it went out, it's now live, it went out with canary, staged out, increased, old one died out, all is good. If it ends up failing, you roll back. Nice. It's in, you, can, you can initiate rollback by yourself, or in case where something actually wasn't caught properly, it may end up being that if it's if it introduces a regression which you didn't catch, production is, is supposed to roll it back automatically for you. When I say that production rejects bad deployments, is something which is relatively harsh concept, and I know it's something which a number of banks would probably love to have. We are there for most parts, but it does, does, does depend that every single service that is sent out must be 
re fully observable. So they must provide telemetry and the deployment logic has to, has to codify the rules by which it is allowed to go out fully. Nice. And okay. that's basically it. And any service which lacks those the telemetry, either you need a human babysitting the deployment, at which point you're twiddling your thumbs yeah. while something happens, or you would rather fix the code so that it actually provides the, the telemetry so you can have it happen automatically. Do, do you look at um, rollbacks, fixes, maybe even customer feedback to assess productivity of your teams? Or how do you look at your teams being productive? If we flip that question around. I actually use the same, same one I used before, as in how are their customers behaving? Fine. As in, every team has their customers. If, if their customers are happy and they are not blocked and, and they can rely on, on, on your product, then your team is doing good. Good. And it does mean that also when, other team, when the team that is your customer knows what is coming down the line, and they can trust that, that estimates roughly uh, reflect reality. Also, they know that they, their own timelines and timeframes for releasing something with depend, depends on new features works. And then only when those, those expectations end up mismatching or there's a large gap between them, then there's a question, okay, what's happened? As in, should we have, been, should we have known earlier that this is going to take longer? Yeah. Should, should have, would, it have, would it have allowed other teams to maybe sort of switch their priorities and change because if, they know that the feature they depend on is not coming out yet. At that point, can they have their own feature development sort of move, move them back burner and do something which can they proceed forward? And then when they know that the feature they depend on is being rolled out or will come available in a week or two, at that point, can they put, okay, we can put more effort into our old feature, which depends on that one. So when the new feature rolls out, we can make use of it fairly shortly. Nice. So it is literally a matter that are your customers okay and are, they, are your customers happy with what, what is happening? Nice. I love that. Is, is there anything that we haven't covered that represents your culture and maybe represents the workflow uh, that you do that we haven't explored that you can share with us? Because there's some really good learning points for people here that they can introduce and start creating more conversations between their team, other teams, any other workflows or points? There's actually, there's one. And I think I'm going to take, take a step back even further because I, we, we talked about culture, but we haven't talked about what creates a culture. And culture is mainly driven. Actually, let's take it even further back. Culture is what people choose to do even if no one else was go, telling them to do something. That's effectively what culture is, what happens or, organically. And that is driven by what are the values of your cult, of your business? What are the core things your business really wants to focus on? If it's customer centric, that drives your culture. If it's reliability, that drives your culture. If it's about making sure that that you can roll, you can introduce changes without breaking breaking things, that drives your culture. Yeah. If it's about if it's about max, maximizing uh, business value, that's one thing. Maximizing uh, Transaction value, that's one thing. If it's about minimizing latency, that's another thing. But you can only have three or four cornerstones in, a, in business values that then drive the culture. And for that one, when everyone knows what the company expects, the culture will sort of align towards providing that in a way which makes sense. But then, in order to support the culture, you need tooling that makes the culture as easy as possible to reach or the end goals of your culture or your business goals. So you provide tooling to make the culture as easy as possible to maintain. Yeah. And you want it to be as, as low friction as possible, as fluid as you can imagine. And that brings a really interesting point. If you want to change a culture in some form or a way, mm -hmm. you need to provide tooling which allows things to change to a better setup in some form. As in, if, if using the old way is the stick. Yeah. Providing something better is a carrot. So people will generally use the thing that, that is, gives them least resistance or the least amount of, of uh, emotional overhead, or he and yeah. they will migrate towards that one. So if you can make something that is really easy to use, people will want to use that over anything else. Okay. If you want to change culture, introduce tools 
that, that makes certain kinds, certain ways of working easier than they were before. And people will not want to go back. What, what tools? Can, can you just specify what you mean by tools? So really good deployment tools, something which allows you to rely that things work. Development tools, effectively, your testing environment, your testing infrastructure, your testing frameworks, how you run them. If you make it really easy to run uh, contract testing across services, people will want to use that because it gives them more reliability. It gives the product more robust. If you make your testing as fast as possible, so adding new tests or new test scenarios is not an overhead. It doesn't introduce more latency into your development cycle. If something takes for a long time or is complex, people don't want to do it. Yeah. Okay. So that's part of that why we have our workflow bot, as in because it optimizes for the heavy path in, in, the, in engineering. You create a new feature or a change. You push it to branch, you have it reviewed. Yeah. Once it's reviewed, it gets approved and assigned to the bot. Bot will push it to the master, meaning that once you've developed a feature which you know you want, you can rely that it ends up being, being in master or even deployed automatically once everyone else is okay with it. So you as an engineer have the idea that I can do, I can do development here, yeah. I can put it out to being tested, verified, reviewed, approved, and rolled out uh, in the knowledge that it will happen while you already are going somewhere else. Nice. Okay. So the happy path yeah. in engineering effectively me is is optimized and it does mean that that when that path fails it means that you also as, an, as someone who develops new features or code you want to remove the, the amount of things in flight at the same time because once you have to swap between them it's a contest switch it irritates someone yeah so it actually gives an incentive to also make sure that the things you put out in a branch are as tiny as possible as easy yeah. to test as possible so they don't come back to you for rework yeah Really, really, really well explained. Okay, um, and and that's uh, and now I understand what you mean by tools. Good. Um, yeah. I think that that last point specifically will be able to help people massively um, think about introducing um, just a workflow like that. Um, I've I've really enjoyed talking, running through. Um, some of the ideas and what you've been able to ingrain in the engineering culture at Smarkit. You know, it's um, it, it's an interesting business with lots of challenges. It's high pressure, but I think you've been able to nail that with what works under the surface. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the valuable lesson here is that that what we have it works for us, for our environment, yeah. our business needs, our culture. As in, if, if you're looking watching this and you want to try things out, don't try to copy what we do. Yeah. Pick something we've done, introduce that into your business cycle or into your workflow in a way that makes sense for you. Yeah. As in, trying to lift and shift a workflow, a process or culture from somewhere else, it never works. Yeah. What you are effectively lifting is a facade. And underneath, you have something which is completely different and it won't work. It has to be... Every workflow you have has to be custom made and tailored to your particular needs. And your whatever business you run, you have your own requirements, which actually dictate the core concepts, the four, three or four pillars, and also what your workflow can actually accept and sustain. Okay. Um, are you look? Are you looking to bring engineers and other people into your workflow? If people are listening. You know, should they reach out to you or is there a time later on in the year, next year, that they should think about reaching out? If you want to reach out, by all means, have a look at our workflow tool bot, as in March bot. And again, the concept of Evergreen Master is not new. There are other tools that do the same thing for, our, for our other companies to other environments. Ours works for uh, self-hosted GitLab. There are tools that do the same against uh, enterprise GitHub or just a GitHub workflows elsewhere. These are not new concepts. We happen to have tools that work for, for us and our environment. But even then, if you want to try from somewhere, just introduce the in-branch testing and effectively inhuman uh, master merges. No. And I use the word inhuman there uh, deliberately, because if you need if you need someone to be there to, to be at as, as Git merge being master, you're doing it already wrong. Nice. So if you can get rid of that one, it's a really good start. 
Nice. Um, seriously, thank you so much. Um, this will provide a lot of people value. Thanks for taking the time. You know, I do really appreciate that. If you're listening and um, you think Mika's got some really interesting points, reach out to him, have a look at um, Smarkit's workflow bot. And you'll be able to get a better idea of maybe how to implement some of that into what you're doing. Uh, like, share, retweet some of what we're doing as well. If you're doing things interesting, doesn't even make sense. If you're doing some interesting things, reach out to us, reach out to me. There's probably a chance that I'm trying to reach out to you as well. Come and share your stories with us. Help other people learn. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Mika. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. We'll see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. And for everyone watching, keep safe and keep sane. I like that. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io. It's no underscore. We've also got a website, which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.